Hi, good morning. Welcome to Healthy Perspective. Thanks to everybody who joins us today. Uh, this is the third and final uh, session that we're going to do talking about the endocannabinoid system, phytocannabinoids, and, and cannabis. And today we're going to focus our attention on uh, primarily phytocannabinoids, but uh, you know, mention briefly the endocannabinoids. So for those of you who didn't see the first two um, sessions I did on this, let me just review a little bit about uh, this. The, just as we discovered um, the endorphin receptors, uh, which are called, op interestingly enough, opioid receptors, uh, from studying why the uh, alkaloids and opium poppy like uh, uh, morphine, heroin kind of stuff works, um, trying to figure out what cannabis did in the body, uh, researchers discovered an entirely new system that they did not know existed. Uh, and uh, it's called the endocannabinoid system. And what's really interesting about the system is it's found uh, throughout the body, uh, in most of the tissues of the body. And this is a feedback system. So what it is, is the, the body is constantly trying to maintain a state of homeostasis, which is a, a, a biochemical balance. And so when uh, something happens to us, we get injured or we have, uh, we're under stress or something, the, the body gets kind of knocked out of balance and it has to find its way back to balance. And it appears that the uh, endocannabinoid system is the system by which our body seeks to regain balance. So in the nervous system, this works because um, you have a, a neuron, the sending neuron releases uh, uh, neurotransmitters into the synapse. And the receiving neuron receives those neurotransmitters, gets uh, stimulated so that it will fire a signal off to other nerves. Now, what the endocannabinoid system does is the, the receiving neuron, when it starts to become overstimulated, that, it, that it's getting too much signaling, it releases the endocannabinoids back into the synapse, which travel in the opposite direction and uh, bind to receptors in the sending neuron, which then calms down or shuts down that signal and rebalances the system. So um, this also is happening in the gut and the skin, in the immune system and so forth. And so the whole purpose of the system is to seek balance. So for example, if, if you become stressed over something, uh, and uh, you're, you're emotionally upset, the endocannabinoid system it starts increasing its signaling, trying to bring your body back into a state of homeostasis and balance. And it learns, like any other system, it learns. So when you first encounter something scary and, and uh, it gets you upset, the endocannabinoid system kicks in and helps you find your way back to homeostasis. And then uh, later, as you can continue the encounter that situation again, when you confront it, the endocannabinoid system kicks in faster and you don't get stressed over it anymore. So basically the body learns that. Now, now the problem with um, <clears throat> phytocannabinoids, as I talked about in the last session and any other thing that we do, that we introduce from outside the body to affect these chemical messaging systems is that they can become a substitute. In other words, if we're under stress and, and, and a person then smokes pot to try to deal with their stress, they, they send the message, you know, to calm down the body, but the body isn't learning to do that itself. That's the, the danger of, of drugs. So uh, the body's primary uh, endocannabinoid uh, is uh, this anandamide, which is made from arachidonic acid, which is an omega-3 essential fatty acid. It's found in chocolate, uh, but which is which I think is very interesting because chocolate also contains stuff that affects the op opioid receptors, which is one of the reasons why a lot of us crave chocolate when we're feeling upset is it actually has, you know, phytochemicals that are, are uh, you know, trying to signal 
a good well-being again. So we're looking for uh, for well-being. Uh, there's some other uh, endocannabinoids, but what we have in nature is we have phytocannabinoids, which are plant-based cannabinoids, just like there are phytoestrogens. They're really uh, phytoendorphins. There's phytochemicals that um, basically bind to the uh, cannabinoid receptors or influence the cannabinoid receptors, thus influencing the system from the outside of the body rather than from the inside. So um, cannabis, for which the cannabinoids got named, because that's what they were studying when they found them, uh, are also turning up in other medicinal plants that we uh, know of. And I think that kind of research is still in its infancy, and I'm pretty sure we're going to find other medicinal plants actually affect the endocannabinoid system. Uh, as we'll talk about later today, it appears that many essential oils actually affect the uh, endocannabinoid system as well. So um, as we talk about the phytocannabinoids, recognize that kava affects that system. Echinacea, uh, kava affects the brain part of it, helping to restore that feeling of kind of well-being uh, mentally and emotionally. Echinacea more affects the, the um, immune system part of that. So there are other plants that can that they have been identified that contain these things. Now, the the one that is the 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 one that people are concerned about and problematic is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. Now, this is the thing in the marijuana plant that has psychoactive effects, i.e., that makes you high. And this is still illegal in many states. Now, there are states that have um, uh, made marijuana uh, uh, okay uh, medicinally. So they, they've allowed for the medical use of marijuana. Um, and when we talk about marijuana, I'm talking about um, cannabis that is high in THC. Um, and there are also states that have legalized that for recreational use. Now, as I mentioned in the last webinar, I'm, I'm not very big on using um, uh, marijuana recreationally, although I do think marijuana definitely has some medicinal uses. THC does actually have some medicinal benefits for certain people. However, you aren't going to be able to get that in states where it's illegal. And in states where it is legal, you should be aware that probably when uh, marijuana was first uh, being used by people maybe 50 years ago or 60 years ago, the content of THC was probably like one or two percent. Now they have bred cultivars of this plant that up that up to around 30 percent or they even concentrate it and make it higher and that makes it much more dangerous psychoactively. THC um, was discovered in 1964 and basically it's created when a compound found in the plant called THCA is heated. So that's why smoking marijuana or, or basically uh, uh, baking in brownies or doing something to heat it actually is what makes it psychoactive. And THC is the most uh, psychoactive cannabinoid, and it does have the potential to develop tolerance with chronic use. That is, someone who smokes pot all the time is basically sending messaging through their endocannabinoid system that everything's fine, everything's in balance, you know, pull, putting everything kind of artificially back into a, a state of balance without actually having uh, necessarily dealing with the problems and so forth. And that is, of course, then masking things, which like any other addiction, when you when you try to run from your problems by drinking alcohol or or you try to avoid getting sleep by drinking coffee or or whatever, your, your body starts uh, building up a tolerance to it, uh, meaning that the body starts trying to find ways to override what you're taking in internally to try to get messaging through. And people then often use more of the substance, drink more alcohol, take more coffee, smoke more, more marijuana in order to try to uh, get around the body building up tolerance to it. And that is what becomes addictive and causes withdrawal symptoms. The evidence uh, is showing that Occasional use of THC marijuana 
in adults over age 25 is probably not any more harmful than uh, you know having a glass of wine or a beer once in a while um, as, as long as it's not you know like escapism however there is a growing body of research showing that people who are especially in their teens who start using marijuana that it adversely affects the development of the brain and therefore can have long-term use so it's one of the reasons why i don't recommend uh, uh this uh psychology. now i don't recommend this to be used recreationally now there are um young uh, people who have severe uncontrollable seizures who uh, getting a hold of thc uh, rich uh, cannabis have been able to get their children's seizures under control with an appropriate dose of this so it's not that it's not uh, potentially medically useful it's just that it, it is does have potential for abuse and one of the reasons why is because thc directly mimics your endocannabinoids binding to endocannabinoid receptor sites and uh, effectively. I don't think THC affects the brain if it's applied topically. Now, THCA is non-psychoactive, and it is the main cannabinoid in unheated cannabis flowers. And so you, you heat it. Now, the TC, THCA um, is anti-inflammatory and actually does uh, uh, have anti-tumor effects. It's also an anti-spasmodic and possibly an anti-convulsant and is also an agent that is anti-nausea. Now, a lot of these effects uh, spill over into why uh, cannabis has been used uh, uh, medically. For example, it's been used to reduce nausea and side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, to relax muscle spasms and, and, and so forth. Now, CBD uh, is a different issue. Um, CBD uh, is, was typically found uh, along with THC in, in cannabis, although, um, as I said, most of the recreational marijuana has been bred to be lower in CBD and higher in uh, THC, whereas hemp, um, which is uh, the kind of cannabis that's now legal to grow under very strict government regulations in this country and is the one that's opened up the market for CPD products, um, is that the, uh, the government basically says that if, the, if you have less than, I think it's 0.3% THC, then you can legally grow the hemp kind of cannabis, uh, which has still has um, cannabinoids, but doesn't have a lot of THC. Now, CBD is the primary um, uh, non-psychoactive phytocannabinoid in cannabis and the one that's receiving a lot of attention right now. Uh, as it, I even have showed up in the natu local natural grocers. Um, it is right now, just so everybody knows, uh, being somewhat scrutinized by the FDA. The legal standing of CBD, especially isolated from hemp and the idea of using it as a nutritional supplement, the FDA is looking at this and still the whole regulatory climate is very up in the air. Still, with the widespread use of CBD products, I think that CBD is probably here to stay and is probably not going to be... Uh, um, regulated out of existence. However, the biggest concern is people making wide and unsubstantiated claims for this um, because it's still, it, even if this is sold as a nutritional supplement, um, then it, the FDA regulations prohibit you from making medicinal claims for it if you're uh, uh, selling it. So cannabidiol, okay, um, is not only non-psychoactive, if it's present with THC, it reduces the psychoactive effect of THC. So if someone has been smoking high THC weed and they're getting bad effects from it, by taking CBD, it'll actually help to counteract a lot of those effects. Now, low doses, the, and this is an interesting thing because this happens with other medicinal plants too, where small doses have an opposite effect of a larger dose. So for example, 
a drop of lobelia can allay nausea and vomiting, a large dose of lobelia will cause nausea and vomiting. So there, there is something to homeopathy. Um, uh, a smaller amount of chamomile will help you relax. A lot of more chamomile will actually be stimulating to you. So a small amount of CBD will make you more uh, alert. A larger amount can calm you down. The, the CBD does not have the problem that THC has in causing tolerance or withdrawal symptoms. And the reason why is because it isn't uh, directly binding to the receptor sites for endocannabinoids. In other words, it's not stimulating the endocannabinoid receptors. What it does is it uh, binds to the endocannabinoid receptor, making it more sensitive or more responsive to the body's own endocannabinoids. So when the body releases endocannabinoids, CBD makes the, the system work more efficiently. So it isn't substituting for your body's uh, endocannabinoids, it's just enhancing their effects. Now, what that means is, is that um, it can mediate pain, inflammation, anxiety, and certain other things because the feedback system for the the endocannabinoid system basically helps uh, calm down the pain response. It helps uh, when, when, the, when a, the, a body gets into an inflammatory cascade, uh, which is the initial response to damage to the body, that inflammatory cascade has to at some point reverse and start, the system has to start returning to normal. And apparently that's part of what the, uh, uh, endocannabinoid system does is it helps to restore the normal. You, your, your body's knocked out of stress by an injury and inflammation. The endocannabinoid system kicks in, helps to reverse the in, uh, inflammatory response and take the thing back to normal. You, the, it helps uh, bring, stop the pain receptors from firing and bring the pain back to normal. Now, one of the reasons why this is potentially very, very helpful is because when you're dealing with stress, which is what anxiety is based in, or when you're dealing with pain. If a person has been under a, a lot of chronic long-term pain or stress, they, they develop an internal anxiety or fear that basically helps to perpetuate the, the pain or anxiety or, or problem. In other words, a person can become so conditioned to pain that, that even though the, the injury is long gone, the pain signaling system is still hypersensitive and overfiring and needs to be calmed down. In other, and that's the job of the endocannabinoid system. Same thing for chronic inflammation. The body needs to be nudged back into a, a, a homeostasis. So CBD therefore has the potential to come in and where the, the body's kind of stuck in this dysfunctional mode, come in and tweak the endocannabinoid system back into a more balanced function to help mediate that and, re and restore the body to a more uh, normal uh, function. Now, CBD is not the only cannabinoid in cannabis. Uh, CBDA is, uh, just like the THCA, is the form of uh, uh, cannabidiol, cannabidiol, I mean, that is found in raw and heated cat, cannabis flower. So generally, when, when, when you make CBD products, they're again extracting the cannabis with heat. And the traditional way to do that was to make uh, cannabis oil. So, so you, uh, you extract the herb in oil um, because these uh, uh, cannabinoids are made from a, an essential fatty acid component. So they're, they're fat soluble rather than water soluble. You extract that out in fat and then you use the CBD oil, okay? Um, there are some people who have managed to make water soluble compounds of CBD, but uh, most of it is ex extracted in fat. Now CBDA has, uh, is a COX-2 inhibitor. It's anti-inflammatory. It also is anti-tumor. By the way, a, 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 a cancer cell, of course, is a cell that has, uh, been under stress to the point that it has mutated or deviated from the normal metabolism of the body and is basically growing and multiplying out of control. 
and the immune system has to be able to recognize and destroy these. So basically, again, by tweaking them and modulating immune responses, it can actually help the, uh, fight the, the cancer. And it also reduces nausea, making it useful for the side effects of, of uh, chemotherapy. Now, there's also uh, one called CBN. Uh, CBN, yeah, I'll turn the thing back on because there's space to fit in here, was discovered in 18, uh, maybe uh, that should have been 1999. <laughs> anyway, it's a breakdown product, THC, and uh, uh, levels increase as THC de degrades over time. CBN is mildly psychoactive, and its presence in uh, cannabis increases the psychoactive effects of THC if, if it's a THC risk rich cannabis. CBG is a non psychoactive um, cannabinoid that is found in higher quantities in hemp. In hemp, in other words, hemp hemp contains a lot of this instead of having a lot of THC. And the problem with this one is they're they're finding it hard to isolate it. Now, now the medical community is studying this uh, for the purpose that they always study these things is they are looking to how do we make drugs out of this how do we make targeted drugs that will you know target certain parts of the endocannabinoid system and and tweak the body and or inhibit it and they, they've already come up with drugs that do this some of them haven't worked very well but um that's what that's what is fueling the research behind this is what i'm saying so CBG has been found to be very immune enhancing. It, it, it has, again, that anti-inflammatory quality, but it also is antifungal, antibacterial, and anti-tumor. In the nervous system, it reduces anxiety. It uh, helps uh, alleviate depression. It's a muscle relaxant. And it is the compound that primarily decreases pressure in the eyes, which is uh, glaucoma. So one of... Uh, Years ago, when I was first studying uh, medical marijuana, some of the things that I felt that marijuana had a legitimate use for was one um, helping with cancer, especially fighting uh, cancer uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation side effects, but also somewhat in helping to actually directly uh, deal with the cancer. Also uh, seizures, and another one was glaucoma, uh, reducing the pressure in the eyes. And it appears that it's CBG that primarily does that. CBG also promotes bone growth, uh, acts as an appetite stimulant, um, and helps to lower blood pressure, which uh, would uh, be part of its muscle relaxing qualities. So um, the, the reason why I, I'm talking about some of these lesser known uh, cannabinoids is because when, whenever you start making these discoveries, the whole goal of medicine, and it seems like the whole goal of the uh, uh, nutraceutical industry has been to, oh, we found this compound, let's isolate, let's concentrate it, let's make it stronger, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's, so, so CBD, uh, you know, is, is being like promoted as the, or, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing, but there's a whole bunch of other phytocannabinoids in cannabis, and this is one of them. Um, uh, turn off the camera here again for a second. CBC is another one of these uh, that's also non-psychoactive, and it it has an effect of allowing the endocannabinoids produced by the brain to last longer, sort of like what a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor uh, uh, does in um it do, does in in your brain with serotonin so in other words it helps it helps potentize the effects of your endocannabinoids uh and it may also help with the viability of developing new brain cells some of the properties that have been discovered in the research they've been doing on this particular phytocannabinoid uh indicate that it is anti-inflammatory anti-tumor and antifungal that it acts as a pain reliever, it's an analgesic, and it's also an anti-anxiety uh, uh, cannabinoid. It also promotes bone growth. 
it binds to the receptors for pain. So um, uh, it, it, it gets into the, the, the neurons that are involved in pain, but, um, but not to the receptors in your brain. So in other words, THC binds to pain receptors, but it also binds to um, receptors in your brain that make you high. This one binds to the pain receptors, but doesn't bind to the receptors in your brain, so you don't get high. So it has a, a solar effect to THC, but it, it, as far as pain relief, but it doesn't uh, cause the psychoactive effect. And it specifically has been found to possibly be helpful for breast cancer. Now, THCV is a potent antagonist of cannabinoid receptors. Now, what that means is that it binds to cannabinoid receptors and doesn't stimulate them. So an agonist binds to a receptor in the body and stimulates it. An antagonist binds to a receptor and blocks it. So um, lobelia contains lobeline, which is an alkaloid, which binds to uh, receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine in the body. But instead of stimulating them, it blocks them. So Epinephrine and norepinephrine make your muscles tense. Lobelia makes your muscles relax because it acts as an antagonist. So this particular variation of THC suppresses the effects of THC in lower in low doses, but in higher doses it enhances it. Oddly enough, um, it all but it does lower the amount of time that THC has psychoactive effects. Um, so there's a particular chemovar, which is, so what they've been doing is breeding different strains of cannabis and experimenting with different strains of cannabis and finding the different strains of cannabis actually have different medicinal properties, uh, partly due to their, uh, you know, level of different phytocannabinoids they contain, but also due to the terpenes they contain, which is what we'll explain about in a minute. So the, this, Chemovar has a THC to THC V ratio of six to seven. So there's six parts THC, uh, seven parts THC V. And there's research showing it's been helpful for post traumatic stress disorder and Parkinson's disease, which is, I think, a very uh, promising thing. The properties of this one include that it enhances the immune system. Act, uh, it also acts as an analgesic, it's anti anxiety, anti convulsant, and it decreases appetite and promotes bone growth, which is interesting because THC increases appetite. People who are known to smoke pot are well known about getting the munchies, having their appetite increased. CBDV is another non-psychoactive cannabinoid with properties that are anti-convulsant, anti-nauseous, promotes bone growth, plays a role in pain and inflammation, and possibly has anti-inflammatory and pain-relieving properties. CBGA is a precursor to THCA and CBDA, as well as CBG and CBC. And it's been found to have properties of being analgesic, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. Um, so now this leads into a very, very interesting thing because one of the issues that herbalists have had, like me have had for a long time is this idea that, uh, that I believe, and, and this is partly as I'm going to explain in my webinar tomorrow about the body is not a machine, that believing in a divine creator, what part of what switched me over from chemical medicine to herbal medicine was this, which was the thought that when God made the whole, he knew what he was doing, and that our attempts to concentrate and isolate are often... Um, misguided and that maybe the whole plant is better than isolated extracts of certain active constituents. Now, th this has been the tendency throughout the whole history of herbalism is the, the scientific people get involved with, with medicinal plants and they're always looking for the, the quote unquote active compounds so they can concentrate them and make drugs out of them and, and, and make these magic targeted bullets. And when it comes to medicinal plants, the, 
like for example, St. John's wort. Nobody knows for sure everything St. George's wort does, but it doesn't is not doesn't just act as an SSRI uh, like uh, an SSRI drug. It actually affects multiple neurotransmitters in the brain, as well as stuff going on in the gut, and it has this holistic effect that works on the body as a whole using a, a, a variety of chemical compounds. Well, this is also true of the whole cannabis plant versus just isolated CBD. So the entourage effect is that there are scientists who have figured out that the a, a diverse naturally occurring variety of terpenes, uh, cannabinoids, and also flavonoids that are present in the cannabis plant actually work together better synergistically than um, isolated CBD or THC. So in other words, if you get a good cultivar of um, uh, cannabis hemp that, that has CBD but also has many of these other cannabinoids, and by the way, I highlighted the major ones that we know about. Uh, there have there are now over 100 phytocannabinoids that have been extracted from the cannabis plant. Over 100, just like there's a whole bunch of different alkaloids in uh, the opium puppy. There's a, about 14 different alkaloids besides lobe, lo, lobeline in lobelia, and on and on and on. Plants are very very complex mixtures of things. So. What, what saying is that the other compounds in cannabis, particularly the terpenes, which are components of essential oils, enhance the effects of cannabis. And the different varieties of cannabis may have more specific therapeutic uses. Like I, I saw, watched a presentation where a guy was explaining that certain cultivars of cannabis work quite well against cancer, other ones don't. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use cannabis on all of these things. It just means that you have to think of cannabis like we would think of any other herb. It, it, it isn't replacing all of our other herbs in the herbal thing, and neither is CBD, but it is another tool in our arsenal to be, be able to, to help people. And th this whole idea that is happening and, and medical, I just, there's an article in the H Journal recently uh, that basically says thing, medicine is finally figuring out that complex mixtures of things work better than isolate, idle isolates. And so this idea that whole plants work better. So if what you want is ideally is not necessarily a concentrated CBD extract. Now that may be helpful, but what you really want is uh, a, a whole extract of that contains numerous phytocannabinoids because a variety of phytocannabinoids is going to work better to tweak the body back to homeostasis naturally than isolated CBD, okay? Or, or the high THC cultivars that are sold for recreational purposes. So you, uh, this, this is a very important concept and it's very, very um, in line with what I've always believed about herbs. And that leads into the, the terpenoid discussion, cannabis and aromatherapy. So um, there are numerous terp terpenoids, uh, which are components of essential oils. They're not the only components of essential oils, but they're, they're found in many essential oils, and there's lots of them in the cannabis plant. And some of the different cultivars part of the variation in the cultivars is the variation in their terpenoids. Now, what is interesting about this is understanding that terpenoids enhance the effect of the phytocannabinoids means that terpenoids and essential oils are probably also working synergistically with our endocannabinoids to tweak the body back to balance, which is kind of an interesting discovery. So in other words, um, one of the reasons why you maybe go out into a, a, a pine forest after a rain and you're smelling the earth and the pine trees and all of these wonderful scents, it makes you feel good, is because it is tweaking your endocannabinoid system and tweaking your body back to a greater state of homeostasis, which means that uh, 
essential oils then ought to be able to have a synergistic uh, property, synergistic properties in working with um, CBD and other phytocannabinoids to tweak the, the endocannabinoid system back to balance. Now, one of these that's been receiving quite a bit of attention uh, is b caryophylline uh, beta caryophylline uh, which is a woody, spicy fragrance that's often found in CBD-rich uh, chemovars of cannabis. And this one actually may um, um, be, be able to bind directly to uh, endocannabinoid receptors. Now, this is found in uh, black pepper. It's one of the main essential oils that contains this particular terpene, which I thought was very interesting because when I was uh, playing with essential oils for the, the purpose of um, uh, doing my energetic aromatherapy course, and we were looking at, and also my chart, and we were checking how essential oils affected the different um, energy centers of the body and uh, did this black pepper seemed to have a balancing effect on all the energies of the body it it had a kind of it 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 energized and vitalized and balanced the entire body and if 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 it is uh, uh one of the main sources of this particular caraphylene that would suggest that the uh, essential oil black pepper actually has ability to help work with the endocannabinoid system to bring the body back to homeostasis. I like that's, uh, you know, very interesting. Um, this activates CB2 receptors in the immune system in the gut. So it, uh, it's not so much an effect on the brain as an effect on the, the body. It is analgesic. It's also antibacterial, antifungal, anti-tumor, and anti-inflammatory. So, in in a uh, in a can in a CBD-rich uh, cannabis that also has this in it, that that it's going to act synergistically with the CBD to increase its immune-enhancing and analgesic properties. Uh, it enhances the THC protection of gastric cells. So in other words, THC helps protect your gut cells and it enhances the anti-inflammatory effects of CBD. So when this is used, you know, present with the CBD, it, it makes the CBD become even more anti-inflammatory, creating an entourage or, or synergistic effect. Lemonine, which is a spicy citrusy, fragrance that's found in a lot of citrus uh, essential oils, lemon, lime, uh, uh, orange, probably less less so in grapefruit, but mostly um, uh, higher in, in lemons and limes. But it's also found in dill and rosemary and juniper and peppermint. Um, this, this is another one that is common in um, cannabis, and it has anti- depressant and anti-anxiety effects, enhancing the antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects of CBD. So for example, there that would mean that if we put, um, you know, a CBD extract with together with uh, some oils that were rich in this particular compound, like uh, lemon, lime, rosemary, peppermint, etc., it's going to have increased anti-anxiety, antidepressant effects. It also enhances the anti-cancer effects of both CBD and CBG, um, which helps breast cancer cells commit apoptosis uh, and also helps uh, reduce tumors. It suppresses GERD and enhances the anti-GERD effects of THC. So THC reduces gastroesophageal reflux, and this uh, also helps with that process. It is both antibacterial and antifungal and also acts as a bronchial dilator. A pinene has a skunky aroma. It's found in pine trees, rosemary, dill, sage, and eucalyptus, which a lot of these are actually used to open up the lungs, pine, rosemary, and eucalyptus. Um, and this one is anti-inflammatory and antibacterial. 
And if it's present, it reduces the memory loss that's associated with heavy THC use and increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, enhancing mental focus, which is why that part of the reason why that pine and uh, the eucalyptus make you feel so mentally alert and, and bright and so forth. But again, it, it's going to work synergistically with CBD. Linalool, which is uh, one of the terpenes found in lavender, but found in some of the other uh, oils mentioned here, which is a floral, spicy, and citrusy fragrance, is anti-anxiety, analgesic, anti-convulsant, sedative, and calming. It's also antibacterial against the bacteria that cause acne and anti-cancer. So it has synergies. And again, remember, all of these terpenes are found in uh, various uh, hemp, uh, cannabis, marijuana cultivars. Um, <clears throat> therefore, what we're saying is, is that the, uh, the essential oil or aromatherapy component also tweaks the endocannabinoid system and the, and the phytocannabinoids uh, and works in synergy with them. And I, I personally thought this was one of the most exciting things I uncovered in this research, is the idea that we can, we can use essential oils because we've known that essential oils somehow help balance a person uh, mentally, emotionally. And if part of that balance is that they're working with the endocannabinoid system, that helps explain some of their effects, maybe a little better than we had in the past. Again, this is all very cutting edge research. There's still a lot we have to learn. But we know that linalol enhances CBD's anti-anxiety and analgesic effects. That is, it increases its ability to be um, calming it enhances THC's sedation and analgesic effects, and it enhances the anti-convulsive effects of CBD, C THC-V, and CBD-V. B. myrcene is the most common ter terpenoid in THC-rich cannabis, but is not found in hemp. It is found in mango, hops. Now, the hops is interesting because hops is in the same family as cannabis. Uh, there aren't very many plants in this family and hops is, is one of them. Um, it's also found in lemongrass and eucalypt eucalyptus. It's an earthy, has an earthy fruity fragrance and its properties are that it's anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, sedating, acts as a muscle relaxant, analgesic and antidepressant and enhances the effects of THC and it also enhances the anti-inflammatory effects of CBD and CBG. So, um, and humulene, which is found in hops, again, is an isomer of the beta carolophylline, which uh, binds directly to the receptors. And so this, again, comes back to one of our medicinal plants, hops, uh, it has an herba herbaceous woody fragrance, is anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, antibacterial, and su uh, suppresses appetite. These are other terpenoids found in cannabis, which are also, of course, found in other essential oils and some of their particular effects. So again, there's lots and lots of different terp terpenoids in cannabis. Um, which brings us to the main point of this whole discussion. Altering the balance of endocannabinoid system, the, the primary thing that we need to think about with this is that we're nudging the body back to homeostasis. However, one of the things that always concerns me about the way people look at this is they look at these things like, oh, it's a miracle, it fixes the problem. No, it doesn't. Yeah, if, if you are still making poor life choices and you're, you have these negative beliefs and thoughts and uh, all these other things going on in your brain, it's, it, it may help you in the process of overcoming that, but it isn't going to overcome it. Uh, and this is the discussion for tomorrow night. You know, uh, It isn't going to make up for your nutritional deficiencies. If you're deficient in vitamin A, you're deficient in vitamin C, you're deficient in B, B complex vitamins, you're deficient in magnesium. <laughs> the, there's no miracle that phytocannabinoids are going to restore your body back to balance if you aren't getting the nutrients you need. It, it, uh, it's not going to correct your poor health habits. You know, not drinking enough water, uh, not getting enough sleep, not getting exercise. 
but it's not going to fix toxicity. So CB, CBD, CBC, and other phytocannabinoids should ideally be combined with a holistic approach to health. So um, in, in the book that I'm working on, uh, I'm explaining the information that's in the, these three classes I put together on the, the phytocannabinoids, which you can watch. And then uh, my partner, uh, Kimberly Ballas, who is a naturopath, she's been doing study using blood work, uh, checking with, with CBD products. And we're writing a therapy section. So we're taking all of the things that there's research showing that, that CBD and other phytocannabinoids can be helpful for. And we're talking about how you add it to a protocol a holistic protocol for dealing with anxiety, dealing with seizures, dealing with the different things that it's useful for, but approaching it holistically, not from CBD is going to miraculously fix the whole problem. That's the way I believe it should be used. And I think that's what I, I'm, I'm striving for to, to make something more unique. I long believed when I, when I was really interested in uh, medicinal cannabis, which I have been for a long time. I have a friend who's also very interested in it and is, you know, making some products um, right now. He's let me have some samples. I have another person I've worked with who's doing a similar thing, who's sending me some research so I could use it in my book. But, but I've always felt like this should ideally be combined with other remedies like essential oils, nutrients, and so forth, so that you're approaching the problem holistically. So if you're giving the body what it needs, and then you're also giving it this tweak to nudge it back to homeostasis, it's going to help it move back or heal faster and get back into balance faster. So it acts more kind of as a catalyst to make other things work better. Um, and, so, and that's that's really what my approach is. And, and what I'm really hoping is, you know, I've, I've put up videos and on uh, herbs and people who are, you know, cannabis users, you know, like, you know, they think like this is the only plant out there. This is the herb. Okay. And it's often talked about cannabis, uh, the THC-rich marijuana as a gateway drug. Um, and while that's possible, it's it's not necessarily inevitable. I, I would like to see the CBD-rich hemp cannabis become a gateway herb. <laughs> because we're looking at this whole idea of the entourage effect and the idea that the whole is better than the, the sum of the parts, I'm hoping that CBD will get people a renewed interest in plant medicine, whole plant medicine. The idea that whole plants can do things to restore balance and harmony to the body that isolated compounds cannot do. And I, and I think that the endocannabinoid system is just helping us understand a little bit better about how the body works. It's not, you know, uh, going to be a cure-all for everything that people go wrong, as I've already pointed out, but it even has the capability of helping us understand how aromatherapy um, works better. So um, before I open this up for questions, I just want to uh, remind everybody, tomorrow uh, night I will be um, uh, having a two-part webinar. It's free. The link is here. Uh, for uh, the holistic approach, and I'm going to be talking about a, a holistic approach to illness. I've, I've actually had a, I thought this was gonna be pretty easy to put together, but it's actually taken me quite a while to figure out how to, to, to word this and frame this in a way that people could really understand the where, the where I'm coming from, because so many people are so concerned with, you know, treating symptoms, i.e. treating diseases, and it's very hard to get people to understand what it means to look at something holistically. So I think I've found some pretty good analogies that tomorrow night I'll be covering to really explain what I'm really trying to say about holistic healthcare. And so I encourage you to watch that. And uh, if you can't watch it live, it will be posted on uh, the website. So just uh, sign up for it and, um, and you'll get sent to a link, link to the recordings. There are only one more uh, Healthy Perspective webinar this year and one more Seeking Light and Truth webinar. Because I had a problem with people who signed up for the entire series for the year getting dropped 
after a few months if they didn't attend a live session. Um, by the webinar provider service, uh, it might have been a glitch in their system. I'm going to actually do run these next year once a month and actually just put out the link to register. If you register for them and want to just be automatically registered for any of the webinars I'm doing like that, the free webinars, just hit, hit auto subscribe and I'll just subscribe you automatically each month when I come up with a new topic. Uh, otherwise, you'll have to watch my Facebook uh, page. No, the links aren't clickable. Um, I wonder if I have the, uh, I don't have clickable links right now. You, you'll, you'll have to, um, um, I will have the, these handouts will be up on my, uh, the page for this webinar. In fact, they are already are at, uh, um, stephenhorn.com and you'll be able to access, uh, that webinar, uh, there now, um, I'll come to your, let me uh, shut down the slide presentation and we'll come back to that at the end here. And let's just deal with some of the questions that have been asked. Um, what, what, when you, like someone asked about, uh, you're not getting CBG and CBD products. Okay. CBD, some companies are isolating CBD and selling like a CBD uh, isolate that's concentrated. I would recommend looking for a company that has a whole spectrum uh, phytocannabinoid uh, product. That means they found some some appropriate uh, uh, chemovers of, of hemp that have a, a full wide spectrum of uh, phytocannabinoids because I think that's going to have a better result in tweaking the body back to balance. I, I know, uh, Two companies, one launching, one that hasn't, one that's already launched, one that's in the process of launching, that I know and trust have the capability of testing and making sure that they're getting a product that has the the, the full spectrum of cannabinoids, because you you have the only way to know that you're getting that is to test for it. Um, you, uh, so if if you're just buying a product that says CBD, but it's not like a whole plant extract, you don't know whether you're getting the other phytocannabinoids or not. Not that CBD can't be useful by itself, but I just wanted to you understand that there's more phytocannabinoids than uh, CB, CBD. Um, thank you for the plug for the member program. Um, I, I I am doing uh, uh, my newsletter, my Sunshine Cherry newsletter, and my um, um, member webinar on the endocannabinoid system and phytocannabinoids for February, which means that the, the webinar will be held at the end of January and the newsletter comes out at the end of January for February. So right this month is depression and next month is the endocannabinoid system. So if you're interested in joining the member program, uh, you'll, uh, you can just join for one month and get, and get that particular thing. But I'm gonna do something new starting next year uh, in fact, I may, may start it this month. Dave and I are working on it. We're going to uh, offer people just to buy a single member webinar to watch it. So you'll also be able to do that. Um, and I'll be promoting that on my mailing list at stephenhorn.com and also on my uh, social media uh, and Facebook page. Someone says, how would you know if someone is able to methylate hemp and would the CBD be different for methylators with extract? I don't know. That there, there is so much research going on. There are so many companies trying different things. This is a whole new field of study. Um, so what I've done, like I do with anything, uh, even though as I talked about in the beginning, I've been interested in medical marijuana for uh, 30 years uh, and actually had, had used some of it uh, for some specific things. Um, the, the, the whole, this whole flood of research has come out and so I've been getting up to date and understanding the research and figuring out how this whole thing works. But because of my perspective in natural healing, I am really trying to emphasize in my approach to this because I've seen so many fads. I mean, in the natural health field, like it's this and then it's that, and this is the cure-all and then that's the cure-all and this is the thing, it's antioxidants and then it's this. 
And I try to keep this in perspective that health is balance, health is harmony. And as I'm going to talk about, you know, tomorrow night's webinar, you really have to look at the big picture of things. There, there is no miracle cure that's going to make up for, uh, if, if you have a bad attitude about life and you're always negative and complaining and you don't get along well with your family and your people, blah, 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 you're not going to magically fix that by using cannabis <laughs> any more than you're going to magically fix it by drinking or uh, by taking kava or anything. Okay. You have to look at the big picture of things and help people find balance and harmony in their life as a whole, which means helping them, you know, eat a relatively healthy diet, get exercise, get the sleep they need, you know, uh, balance out their life in order for them to be healthy because health is is not just a matter that you're getting certain symptoms and if you fix those symptoms then you're healthy again that isn't necessarily the case symptom fixing doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that you've restored health so uh, that's that's the subject for tomorrow night so i really uh, uh, appreciate all of you who uh, uh, participated today it looks like there are no more questions um but uh, thanks to all of you who've supported me in the, this particular webinar. Uh, the last healthy perspective I'm going to do for this year, I'm just going to do a little uh, special on the herbs for the holidays. Uh, you know, frankincense, myrrh, pine, uh, cinnamon, the, 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 the herbs and spices we associate with holidays just for fun. And uh, my last uh, Seeking Light and Truth show for this year is going to be on uh, finding grace in life. So if you want to watch those, you could get that. Oh yeah, mistletoe. I am going to cover mistletoe because mistletoe is a very useful medicinal plant that uh, is also associated with holidays. So thanks everybody for joining me. I really hope that if if you uh, uh, need help, you know, locating some you know good sources, you know, you could email me privately. I'll help point you in the right direction. But a lot of you already know, you know. Uh, good sources and my primary job isn't to sell products. My primary job is to educate people. Uh, and so I, I try to not get too involved in, in selling products because that comes a conflict with the education. But I hope that this has helped you to understand cannabis better, phytocannabinoids, and also to understand your body better in terms of the endocannabinoid system. So thanks again for watching. Merry, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, how, whatever you want to say, uh, and have a great day. Thanks. And goodbye.